Good evening. And welcome. Welcome to the inaugural Diane Silvers Ravitch, Class of 1960, lecture. I'm Barbara Beatty, and I'm the chair of the education department here at Wellesley. And I can't tell you, this is such a great pleasure for us. And I want to start by thanking Diane for her generosity in making this lecture possible um, through the Diane Ravitch Public, wait a minute, I have to get it just right, the Diane Ravitch Public Education Fund. Um, so that's what's going to make this lecture possible. And this is an annual lecture. So first I want to thank Diane for her generosity to us, to the college, and to the education department. Thank you, Diane. Um, we're going to have, oh, yeah, so I'm hoping you'll come back next year. <laughs> and we'll be giving you lots of publicity, so you'll know in advance. But we're going to have noted speakers on really interesting topics in public education every year. So we're hoping to see you back. Um, the way we're going to work tonight is we're going to have three short introductions. Um, I'm going to be talking about Diane as a scholar, and as a public intellectual, and as a public servant. And then Barbara Mataloni, who was the president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, we're very fortunate to have Barbara here, is going to be talking about Diane's work for teachers in advocacy and for public education. And then Diane's best friend and classmate, Linda Gottlieb, is going to be telling us some tales about <laughs> Diane. Diane and Linda have known each other for years. And so that's going to be the order. And we'll be brief, because we know you want to hear Diane. OK, I want to tell you a little bit about Diane as a scholar, as a public servant, and as a public intellectual. You know, Diane is ranked at the top of Education Week's 2015 list of the most important public scholars in education. For those of you who aren't in education, Education Week is the, it's it. That's our periodical. So that should give you a sense of how impressive and what an impact Diane has had. Um, she's had an illustrious career. Um, she was a political science major here at Wellesley. And then she got her doctorate in history at Columbia University. And she studied with Lawrence Kremen, who was the senior historian of education. So. That was really um, an honor and gives you a sense of the tradition that Diane is carrying on. Um, she was US Assistant Secretary of Education under President H. W. George H.W. Bush and was appointed to the National Assessment Governing Board by President Bill Clinton. When I first met Diane, she was, I have to get this right, she held the brown chair in education studies at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And I was giving a comment at a conference that Diane had organized. And as usual, she had brought together wonderfully interesting people. And we had a great conversation. Um, so being back in touch with Diane has been a real pleasure. So throughout all of these activities, Diane has managed to write prolifically. Um, she's the recipient of many awards, including nine honorary degrees, unless you've gotten another one since, but nine honorary degrees, including an Alumni Achievement Award from Wellesley. Um, she is the author or editor of 21 books um, and has written more than 500 articles and chapters and op-eds and commentaries. Um, so this is just an extraordinary career as a scholar. Um, I use Diane's work in my own research and in my courses, and it is engaging. It's wonderfully, she gets details. Um, she digs deep. And so it's, I can't tell you how valuable it is, how engaging it is, so read it. <laughs> um, from her first book, the Great School Wars, through her most recent book, 
Reign of Error, Diane has dealt with critical themes in American education, centralization and decentralization, top-down, bottom-up reform, standards, achievement gaps, privatization, school politics, economics of education, school finance reform. Um, I could go on. The role, and most importantly, everything that Diane has touched on deals with the role of public schools in social justice in a democracy. That's really the essence of what Diane is about. Um, Diane has also done something that very few top scholars do. She has publicly changed her mind. Um, after seeing the effects, and she did it for the best of reasons, after seeing the effects of education policies in classrooms, on students, and on teachers. And that's what she described in her 2010 bestseller, The Death and Life of the Great American School System. Um, since then, Diane's reach as a public intellectual has exploded. Um, she, through her popular blog, check it out, dianeravich.net, and she's going to post this talk tonight there, and we'll have it posted on our Wellesley website, and we're also, um, we're going to post it on YouTube too, so you'll be able to watch it again and tell your friends about it. Um, she's had more than 23 million page reviews, probably even more than that by now, on her blog. If any of you know what that means, that's huge. And she's given many, many talks. And for those of you, OK, three times on The Daily Show. <laughs> the much, so anyway, and other media outlets. Um, I want to end my introduction by giving you a visual image of what Diane has done and how remarkable it is. I want you to think of the vast American public school system. I want you to think of it, you could even close your eyes if you wanted to, I want you to think of it as if it were a giant aircraft carrier with some children taking off, some children having more difficulty taking off, but with a huge superstructure, with a gigantic crew, with wires and separate compartments for different policies, and fuel, maybe not quite enough, but so think of this monstrous, ponderous vessel that is American public education. Now I want you to think about how hard it would be to shift the course of that vessel. Just think about it. And now I want to tell you what Diane personally has done, and this is truly remarkable. Diane Ravitch personally has started to shift the course of American public education. It's true. And tonight, I'm going to let her tell you her own ideas in her own words about what she thinks should happen and where we should go. So now I'd like to introduce Barbara Madaloni, who is going to talk about Diane's activism for teachers and in public education. And I want to tell you a little bit about Barbara first. Barbara is the president. And we're so grateful you to be here tonight, Barbara, because I know how busy you are. Um, Barbara is the president of the 110,000 member Massachusetts Teachers Association. She's on leave as a senior lecturer in the Labor Studies Department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she also coordinated, and we love this, the secondary teacher education program in their school of education. Um, Barbara is, is, she's the leader of a special progressive caucus within the MTA that's called the Democratic Union, Educators for a Democratic Union. Um, she's also given many talks, published blogs. I want to tell you one incident. Um, when Barbara was teaching the class, one of her classes at UMass, she supported her student 
when her class decided to boycott Pearson, Inc. Now, Pearson is the giant education publisher that at that point had just come out with a standardized teacher education assessment program. But Pearson is also the publisher of the Park, which is the test for the Common Core, and of all sorts of scripted programs. I mean, Pearson is everywhere. And Barbara supported her students when they boycotted Pearson. Um, and she got written up in the New York Times for doing it. Um, Barbara has also staked out the MTA's position um, against Governor Baker's proposal to lift the cap on charter schools, which <laughs> which she sees as a call for privatization of public education. Barbara was an English teacher at Northampton High School and at Frontier Regional School in South Deerfield. Thank you, Barbara. Good evening. Uh, it's delightful to be here. I, um, I think what I want to talk about briefly is to sort of uh, dig a little bit into this idea of uh, Diane as a public intellectual and what that means in terms of being both a scholar and an activist. Uh, and in particular, uh, what that has meant for educators uh, like myself and like my members and others across the country. I was thinking about uh, sort of the three words that we talk about when we talk about organizing and building a movement, educate, agitate, and organize. Uh, and if you're in a movement, you say those things on a regular basis. Uh, I want to explore the word educate a little bit because I think Diane's work uh, reminds us how critical the educate piece is to that. Uh, when I think about educating as sort of the first step of any organizing movement, I think about how important it is to name what's happening and to name it not in the ways that we've been told to name it. This is good for children. This is uh, not about privatization. This is just about what our children need. Teachers are failing. Public schools are failing. But it's about naming what is actually going on seen through the narrative that we've been given and articulating that. Freire talks about finding the generative themes. Uh, it also reminds me of, you know, the emperor has no clothes. It's another way that we tell the story of naming actually what's happening. Uh, Diane's been critical in doing that, uh, and, and it's her work there that has been <clears throat> so much about beginning to shift things uh, and, and shift the course in public education. But, but the way that naming becomes important, and I see this for my members, uh, I, last year I held 37 forums across the state uh, with teachers in Massachusetts. And we talked about, uh, we asked four questions. What it, one is, uh, what is your vision for public education? Uh, two is, what keeps you from being able to achieve that vision? Three is, how do you understand why you're not able to achieve that vision? And four was, what do you want to do about it? What I discovered, and I discovered this in my campaign for president as well, I experienced it last night meeting with the educators in Worcester, is the incredible pain and loneliness that educators are experiencing under the current accountability regime. It is profound. People find themselves doing things that go completely against their hopes, their values, the things that brought them to education. And they feel alone in it. And they don't always understand it. They just know that there's a hungry child in front of them and they're supposed to make sure the objectives are on the board so that the eight-year-old who didn't eat last night will know what the objectives are. What Diane has done in her actions as a public intellectual is help those educators name that experience so that it's not just me alone in a classroom, but it's saying, this is part of something bigger. This is not even just my principal. 
This is not just my superintendent. This is about a larger effort to privatize public education. This is specifically about using high stakes testing to do that. This is specifically about naming me as a failure and giving me this context where I can't actually help the child who I need to help. That's a profound piece of work in our organizing efforts. It's really important that we name it. And then Diane has gone further, and I've followed her blogs and her career on this in ways that I find, you know, someday I'll study. Uh, which is, she's developed a really clear analysis of it. So that it's not just this is bad, but let me help you understand why. Let me help you understand who. And to that extent, she's done amazing and critical work in educating. And what I say about the agitating part is really all you need to do is educate, and you get people get agitated. Yeah, I mean, the hedge fund managers are coming after our schools. Just kind of let people know what's going on. I mean, testing is being used as a weapon. Uh, so, so she's got us there. Uh, it's up to us, all of us together, to pick up that work and organize. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can do that after we leave tonight and onward. Uh, so I'm honored to be here to have an opportunity to introduce Diane. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Barbara. Inspiring. Um, now I'd like to introduce Linda Gottlieb, one of Diane's classmates and best friends. How cool to have your BFF here. Um, who's going to tell you a bit about Diane as a person. And she's going to throw Diane for us to you. And that's screenwriter, screenwriter talk. Um, and that's one of the things that Linda does. But before I introduce Linda, I want to say to you that we will have time for questions, that we have microphones on both sides of the aisles, so please feel free. Um, and we're, this is a conversation about public education. We want to hear your ideas as well. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Linda, and then we'll have Diane. Um, Linda is an award-winning film and television producer and a writer. She produced Dirty Dancing. <laughs> One, yes, yes, yes. One of the all-time best movies. If you haven't seen it, see it. And it is one of the best movies as a mom to watch with your mother or to watch with your daughter. Or father's daughters, it works anyway, okay? But it is just a wonderful film, wonderful. Um, Linda's television work has spanned almost every format. Children's, educational, daytime, miniseries, series, um, movies of the week, um, you name it. Um, her credits include Citizen Cone, which was a recipient of nine Emmy Award nominations and an Ace Award, um, Face of a Stranger, Soldier's Girl, The Gentleman Bandit, Bandit, and many, many more, including numerous after-school specials. Um, she co-founded Learning Corporation of America, um, an educational film company funded by Columbia Pictures. Um, she has taught screenwriting at the Tisch School at NYU and at Yale Drama School, um, where she was, and she was a Woodrow Wilson Fellow um, at the Russian Institute at Columbia University, where she received an MA. Um, Linda is also the co-author of When Smart People Fail. Didn't happen to you, but at any rate, maybe we need to read that book too. Um, I, I, we definitely do. When Smart People Fail, a study of how some 200 people coped with career failure. Linda's also contributed to Life, Reader's Digest, Mademoiselle, and many other publications. Thank you, Linda. Hi, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be back at Wellesley and an, a real thrill to introduce my pal, Diane. 
You've already heard all about her august accomplishments. I'm speaking as a member of the class of 1960, and a lot of my buddies are here tonight to tell you the real truth about Diane. <laughs> so here's the dish. Diane, in her Wellesley years, was a wild and crazy girl. <laughs> True. We were not. A little context, this is the time of nude posture pictures. You guys don't remember that. We were asked to sit nude from the waist up to take pictures for our posture. I have no idea why, and no one ever asked why. We also observed calendar day. Calendar day was the day before spring break or Christmas break when you absolutely had to be in your 8 a.m. class or you wouldn't get credit for the semester. So the rest of us, the rest of us would go to bed early the night before and be really ready to go to calendar class on time, calendar day class on time. Diane, on the other hand, decides the day before calendar class would be a swell time to go out with a couple of friends down to see the guys they were dating at Yale. Not only that, she thinks it would be really cool to wear her gym bloomers underneath a raincoat. We were not allowed to wear pants, and that this would be a kind of interesting outfit. And so they go out, and they go to Yale for the evening, and they take the midnight train back to be ready for calendar day class. But in Providence, the train is taken out of service, and they are stranded. So they pool all their money together, and they get a taxi to come careening back to Wellesley, getting them there just in time for calendar day, as Diane reports, totally hungover. <laughs> then, then there was, I promise you these won't be long, but then there was the great rope caper. The girls in BB were given uh, ropes attached to the side of the building, apparently in case of fire, only to be used in emergencies, right? <laughs> You can see where this is going. <laughs> Diane decided it would be a lot more fun to open the window, climb out, fly off the side of the building holding onto the rope, shimmy down the rope, and as she was dangling there, she discovers that she can look into the BB dining room and see all her buddies eating dinner from a completely new vantage point. <laughs> of course, this was a metaphor for her future life. Diane was born in Houston, Texas. <laughs> she was the third of eight children. Her father was a high school dropout. Her mother, an immigrant from Bessarabia, who came to America at age nine. Her parents ran mom and pop liquor stores. Uh, on paper, the odds were stacked against her. What happened to change those odds? Wellesley happened. The reason, the reason that Diane is here tonight is her collision with, that, with this college. Wellesley made us think. Wellesley made us understand that truth was elusive and that if you dug deeply and if you found better and newer research, it was okay, in fact, it was obligatory to change your mind. Wellesley also made us speak up. In those days, they would say, speak up, Miss Salzman. Speak up, Miss Silvers. Speak up, Miss Corbell. That would be Madeline Albright, who was a year ahead of us and one of Diane's friends. And without the distraction of boys to tell us that we were too silly or too smart, we found our voices. So while Diane may have entered college a wild and crazy girl, with a, with a certain amount of physical bravura and bravery, Wellesley forged those instincts into real intellectual bravery. The other great gift Diane, that uh, Wellesley gave Diane was a posse of lifelong friends. Every five years, to this day, four of us pile into whatever car is handy and we head back for reunion. These regular five-year trips form intimate snapshots of Diane's and of all of our lives. The first five years, no one even came. We were too busy paying the rent, struggling. Ten years out, we were all married and raising children. Fifteen years out, one of us was divorced. One had sadly lost a child. Twenty-five years out, 
Three of us were divorced. One had just gotten fired, that was me actually, and one had remarried. <laughs> the cars changed, the husbands changed, the jobs changed, our health changed, but the Wellesley girlfriends remained. To this, to this day, every few months, we get together for lunch in New York. If we're lucky, Patsy comes down from Maine, Joan comes down from Cambridge, sometimes Vicki even flies in from Honolulu. Before she published The Death and Life of the Great American School System, we were having one of our Wellesley Posse lunches at the Botanical Garden in Brooklyn. Diane told us she was working on a book in which she was planning to recant all of her previously held positions. And she was sure that there would be a firestorm of criticism, and she was uncharacteristically nervous. You know, she said, uh, turning to us, most people think that I'm really tough, but actually I'm not. And I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to stand up to all the personal attacks which I think will really come my way. And I just need to know that whatever happens, you all have my back. There was no question of our response. It is no accident that when Diane decided to fund a series of lectures on the role and importance of public education, she picked Wellesley as the venue. It was this college that forged her intellect, that gave her the courage to speak up Miss Silvers, and that gave her the solid backbench to cheer her on no matter what. So please welcome this remarkable Wellesley woman. She may have thrown out the gym bloomers, but she's still that girl who will dangle from a rope to get a different angle on things. The class of 1960s septuagenarian educational rock star, Diane Silvers Rabbit. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> and thank you, Linda. I don't think there's anything else I have to say. Um, I have to apologize for being so gimpy, but my dog pulled my leg, my knee out the other day. And uh, these things happen when you're 77. Anyway, I can't tell, tell you how thrilled I am to be speaking in Alumni Hall when I graduated in 1960, only very important people, like President Margaret Clapp, spoke from this stage. <laughs> One of the speakers that I do remember, however, was an Indian American author named Santha Rama Rao. She was the first student from India to enroll at Wellesley. She graduated in 1944, and she went on to become an accomplished author. And all I remember from her talk was this line, she said, a writer writes. Does that sound profound? Why did, why did that stick in my memory so many decades later? It was a life lesson. It's guaranteed to overcome writer's block. <laughs> Something else important happened on the stage, possibly the only other time that I trod these sacred boards. The class of 1960 staged an amazing junior show called Call It Red. That's where I met my classmate, Linda Gottlieb, Linda Salzman Gottlieb. She was the head of the script committee. I was on the script committee. We staged the show here in 1955, and we re-performed it at our 40th reunion and taped it. It was the best junior show ever. <laughs> Although the class of 59 wouldn't agree. Well, as I thought about tonight, I remembered how I happened to attend Wellesley. As Linda mentioned, I was third of eight children in Houston. We all went to public school. When I was in high school, my rabbi was my mentor, although I was never especially religious. He introduced me to classical music, and he would give me great works of literature to read. And when I was a junior in high school, his wife, Barbara, talked to me about my college plans. I hadn't thought very much about it. Everybody went to either Rice or University of Texas or places nearby. 
but because Barbara had gone to Wellesley, class of 1943, I decided to apply to Wellesley. She took me to an afternoon tea where all the Seven Sisters colleges were represented, looking for diamonds in the rough in Texas, and I was one of those diamonds, I guess. <laughs> she made me promise that I would not end up someday saying, I wish I had taken that class, but I broke that promise. I wish I could start Wellesley all over again and take the wonderful courses in art and music and philosophy and literature and science and history that I didn't take. So please start a program and bring folks like me back. <laughs> T tonight, as you know, is the inauguration of an annual lecture series which I shamelessly endowed in my own name. I did so because I want Wellesley College to be a place where brilliant young women think about the current issues in education and the future of education in our society, especially pre-collegiate public education, K through 12. I know that if they think about it, they will want to make things right, and they will get involved, and they will act. So if anyone out there is either an alum or a student with a lot of money to spare, please invest in this program because the education department has never had an endowment. And I'm endowing not only the lecture series, but also student internships, student research projects. And I'm hoping... <laughs> Barbara told me that the students who want to be teachers have to pay five or $600 to the state of Massachusetts to get certification, and many students can't afford it. That's about $10,000 a year. If anyone out here has an extra $10,000 a year, think about that. Well, I'm placing a bet on Wellesley women and on their commitment to social action and social justice. I want Wellesley College to be a center for thoughtful and sane educational policy. Tonight, I want to talk about the reasons I remain engaged and hyperactive in the field of education, blogging every day, sometimes blogging eight or 10 times a day, speaking in far-flung corners of the nation, and behaving badly for a woman my age. <laughs> a few things really, really bother me. Actually, they not only bother me, they make me very angry, and they motivate me to keep writing and speaking and to create a program at Wellesley dedicated to critical inquiry. One is the current obsession with standardized testing that has infected the brains of our policymakers. Another is the constant refrain from self-anointed reformers that our public schools are declining and failing and that any alternative would be better than public education. The, re the reality is that test scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress have never been higher than they are today for students who are black, white, Asian, or Hispanic. Graduation rates have never been higher and dropout rates have never been lower. And this is true for all of the groups that I named. Most of the gains, by the way, were recorded prior to the current era of test-based accountability. Another thing that makes me really angry is the unwarranted attacks on teachers who deserved respect and admiration, not cheap shots, by people who wouldn't last five minutes in a classroom. <laughs> And another thing that really gets me is the calculated effort to eliminate teaching as a profession by removing all protections for academic freedom, by making teachers at-will employees who can be fired for any reason, who can be fired if they teach about evolution or global warming, who can be fired if they teach Huckleberry Finn or The Invisible Man or some other book that's on the list of censored books of the American Library Association, or even if they try to join a union, any reason is good enough to fire them. Another thing that enrages me is the rise of a for-profit industry devoted to the privatization and monetization of public education. And another is the role played by a handful of billionaires trying to buy control of state and local boards of education so they can control education policies. Just four billionaires are now buying seats on the Louisiana State Board of Education. It's outrageous. I start with the premise that public education is a foundation stone of our democracy. Children do not have to enter a lottery to gain admission to a public school. 
Public schools must accept all children, regardless of their race, their religion, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their language, or their disability. No high-performing nation in the world tests every child every year from grades three through eight as we do. Typically, in other nations, children take an external exam at the end of elementary school, another in middle school, and another in high school. In Finland, they take no standardized tests at all until the end of high school. Sounds like a sensible approach to me. No high-performing nation in the world has charter schools or voucher schools. The nations that have adopted the libertarian ideas of economist Milton Friedman are Chile and Sweden. Both have experienced increased social and economic segregation as the result of increasing publicly funded choices. The nations with high-performing school systems have strong and equitable public school systems. They do not use public money for charters or vouchers. They spend more on the education of the poor than on the education of the affluent. We, however, are one of only three OECD nations that spends more on the children of the affluent than on the children of the poor, and that's wrong. I don't know of any nation that evaluates teachers by the test scores of their students. That is an idea devised by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and promulgated by the U.S. Department of Education. It has utterly failed, and yet it continues in almost every state. Why are states doing this? Well, in 2009, when the nation was struggling through a devastating economic recession, Congress gave the U.S. Department of Education $5 billion to spur education reform, to do whatever it wanted with the $5 billion. And Secretary Arne Duncan came up with the race to the top. Now, I don't know what the top is, and I'm not sure why we would be racing there, because I think our goal is equality of educational opportunity and not a race to the top. But nonetheless, to be eligible to compete for this vast amount of money at a time of tremendous fiscal distress, states had to adopt the Common Core, although they just called it college and career ready standards which turns out to be the Common Core. States had to increase the number of privately managed charter schools. They had to agree to close schools that had low test scores, almost all of which were in impoverished minority communities. And they had to agree to evaluate teachers to a significant degree by the test scores of their students. Now, almost every state wanted the money, and almost every state changed their laws to be eligible to win it. Massachusetts was one of those states that had the misfortune of winning race to the top money. Now, evaluating teachers by student test scores has been tried almost everywhere, and it has worked nowhere. Teacher ratings based on test scores are unstable and invalid. They go up one year, they go down the next, depending on who is in the teacher's class. So a teacher may be teacher of the year one year and found ineffective the next year. And the, if it happens again, she might be fired, even though she had previously been the teacher of the year. In some classes in New York City, we've had teachers who are highly effective teaching math and ineffective teaching reading, which suggested that the teacher might simultaneously get a bonus and be fired. <laughs> those who teach students with disabilities, those who teach English language learners, those who teach gifted children see small or no gains. Those who teach in affluent suburbs turn out to be marvelous teachers. They see strong gains. Where you teach does matter. Well, of course, teachers do matter profoundly. They do make a difference in the lives of children. But test scores are affected more by the home, by, the fa by family income, by student motivation, and dozens of other factors that are outside the control of the teacher. The American Statistical Association issued a statement last year warning against using test scores for evaluating individual teachers. But Secretary Duncan ignored the warning. Test scores today are more important than they have ever been. This method has demoralized teachers and contributed to a growing national shortage of teachers. Many experienced teachers are taking early retirement, while enrollments in teacher preparation programs have de declined sharply across the nation. There's a small but powerful group of people who call themselves reformers. The media calls themselves reformers also, but they're not reformers. They support privatization of public education. They support public, pub, budget cuts to public education. They support high stakes testing. They are indifferent to segregation and poverty. They blame teachers if test scores are low. 
They say that anyone who draws attention to poverty is just making excuses for those bad teachers. Well, who are these, these reformers? They are funded by the Gates Foundation, by the far-right Walton Family Foundation, which spent $200 million this year to advance privatization. They're funded by the Eli Broad Foundation, the Dell Foundation, the John Arnold Foundation of Houston, the Helmsley Foundation, the Michael Bloomberg Foundation, and many more foundations. They fund a network of like-minded organizations that are also financed by billionaire hedge fund managers. These organizations have deceptive names like Democrats for Educational Reform. In Texas, they're called Texans for Educational Reform because it's not a good thing to be a Democrat. Uh, Students for Education Reform, Students First, Stand for Children, Education Reform Now, Educators for Excellence, Families for Excellent Schools, and many more. Families for Excellent Schools has just moved into Massachusetts. And the assumption is they must be black and brown families wanting excellent schools. Well, no, it's like 10 billionaires who don't, have never been in a public school and whose own kids are going to elite private schools uh, and so when you're talking about families, you're talking about people like Paul Tudor Jones, who is worth billions and billions of dollars. He's one of those families for excellent schools. Funny thing is that they don't want your children, our children, to have the same kinds of schools that they want for their children. They don't want schools that have the arts and beautiful facilities and wonderful up-to-date technology and a full and rich curriculum. They want children who learn to walk in straight lines and blow bubbles and uh, who can be disciplined and suspended very quickly. The same goals that I have described are shared by the U.S. Department of Education, whose race to the top policies support high stakes testing, teacher bashing, for profit schooling, and privatization. It's hard to tell the players without a scorecard. The ideas I've been describing are promoted by Democratic governors like Andrew Cuomo of New York and Daniel Malloy of Connecticut, and also by the extreme far right, which hates public education. Many of these policies have been, have been turned into state legislation by a shadowy right-wing group called ALEC, or the American Legislative Exchange Council. ALEC has about 2,000 members who are members of state legislatures. ALEC is funded by major corporations. Its primary goals are deregulation and the promotion of corporate interest. It seeks to weaken or to remove environmental regulation and gun controls, and it has policies for almost everything you can think of. And its members introduce ALEC's model legislation in state after state in education, and there their interest is, first of all, to kill teachers' unions, uh, to eliminate teacher certification, to eliminate any due process protections for teachers, to introduce and legitimate for-profit schooling, to permit vouchers for religious schools, and to permit for-profit virtual schooling. See for yourself. Check out a website called Alec Exposed, and you will see the free market at its worst. The reformers believe that teachers whose students don't get higher test scores every year should be fired. If the bottom 5% are fired every year, the theory goes, Someday, we will have only great teachers left standing in the classroom. It's a very strange theory, don't you think? Because nobody knows where the ax is going to fall next year. It's not working out the way they think, or the way they thought. Instead, these policies have created the, the national teacher shortage that I mentioned. Who wants to become a teacher when pay is low, when legislators tell you how to do your job, and when the media blames you for every social ill? Actually, none of the reformers' ideas have worked out. All of them have failed to produce the educational revolution that they predicted. There are some good charters, some of them in Massachusetts. There are some very bad charters. On average, charters don't produce higher test scores than public schools. Some charters cherry pick their students, accepting few who have serious disabilities and few who are English language learners. Some have no children with serious disabilities and no children who are English language learners. And some of these charters that I describe as bad charters may have high test scores, but they have high suspension rates, even though social scientists advise that suspending children as young as five years old is very bad practice and contributes eventually to dropping out and to the school to prison pipeline. Across the nation, charter operators have been convicted of embezzlement and theft of hundreds of millions of dollars because of a lack of public audits and oversight 
In fact, charter operators have gone to court to say they cannot be audited because they're not actually public schools, they're really private corporations handling public funds, sort of like Boeing. But when it comes time to get the money, they say they are public schools. And in some states, they are legislatively called public schools, and yet they still go to court and say, we can't be uh, made accountable or have uh, public audits. In Arizona, charters do not have to abide by laws preventing nepotism and conflicts of interest, and both nepotism and conflicts of interest abound. There are families that run charters, and everyone on the board is a member of the family, and everyone gives each other contracts to run the school and to provide the, the services. In addition, in Arizona, for-profit charters are not permit, cannot be audited by the state. It's banned, even though they operate with public money. In Florida, there's one for-profit charter chain that has accumulated a real estate empire worth $100 million transferred from taxpayers to the family's bank accounts. There is a for-profit company called K-12 Inc., I think it operates a virtual charter school in Massachusetts. It's the largest provider of virtual charter schooling in the nation. It was founded by the junk bond king, Michael Milken, after he got out of prison. And it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Numerous studies have found that online schooling is riddled with problems. The K-12 schools have a high attrition rate, and sometimes, in some states, as much as 50% of their students leave every year, so they constantly recruit with promises of personalization, customization, individualization. Some of the teachers who work for these uh, virtual charter schools are monitoring a thousand or more screens. That's the individualized instruction. The computer tests are so simplistic and the instruction so poor that the NCAA stripped two dozen of the K-12 schools of their accreditation. Nonetheless, they're very profitable because they're getting full state tuition for, for providing nothing more than a computer and some textbooks. Uh, and no grounds to maintain, no social workers, none of the services that you would expect to find in a regular school. Vouchers, which have long been a priority of the right, have been enacted in about 20 states, even in states where the state constitution specifically bans vouchers, like Nevada and Indiana. Vouchers have never, ever been approved by popular vote. They have always been enacted. Students in voucher schools do not have higher achievement than students in public schools. Many voucher schools are attached to fundamentalist churches where there are no certified teachers and where students are taught creationist versions of science and history. New Orleans is supposed to be the crown jewel of the reformers. Hurricane Katrina wiped out the teachers' unions and damaged many of the schools and the legislature took control of the schools and fired all the teachers, 7,500 of them, 75% of whom were African American, the backbone of the black middle class in New Orleans. And now almost every school in that city is a privately managed charter school. Those with selective admissions have high test scores. Most of the other charters, however, are rated either D or F by the state, which is a very pro-charter State Department of Education. A large proportion of school-aged teens are not in school at all, but no one is in charge of tracking where they are because no one is responsible. Youth violence is very high. The ACT average for the New Orleans district is below what is necessary to enter a four-year university in Louisiana. After a decade of reform, New Orleans remains one of the lowest performing districts and one of the nation's lowest performing states. It's not the proof point that reformers kept looking for. Another of the supposedly shining stars of the reform movement was the Tennessee Achievement School District. A Republican governor appointed Kevin Huffman, who was the public relations director for Teacher for America, to become the state commissioner of education. Kevin Huffman invited Chris Barbick, a TFA alum, to head the Achievement School District. Barbick had previously run a charter chain in Houston called Yes Prep, which supposedly had a great success. When Barbick came to Tennessee, he pledged that he would take the lowest performing 5% of public schools and move them up to the highest performing 25% of schools in the state. And most of the schools in the bottom 5% were either in Memphis or in Nashville. His method was to turn each of the lowest performing schools over to a charter operator. There was community pushback, but it was ignored. The results were all that counted. The clock started ticking on the five-year guarantee and after four years, Barbic had a heart attack and resigned. 
and after four years, four of the six original schools that had been taken over remained in the bottom 5%, and the other two were in the bottom 6%. Barbic admitted that it was easier to transform a brand new school with students who applied than to transform an existing school with students already enrolled. So the Achievement School District, which is now in its fifth year, has not succeeded in meeting its goal or making a difference. But Georgia is about to vote on a constitutional amendment that will permit Governor Nathan Deal to create an Achievement School just District just like the one in Tennessee. Why? The one in Tennessee failed. Why are they going to do that in, in Georgia? Well, it's a good idea, and there's no point looking at facts. <laughs> but failure doesn't deter today's reformers. They press ahead, demonizing teachers, demeaning public education, and ignoring the root causes of school failure. So this is how to ruin education. Do what we're doing now. Make standardized testing the be-all and end-all of education. Expect teachers to produce higher test scores every year or to be fired. If scores don't go up, fire the principals and close the schools. Give the public funds to private organizations that are free of state laws and free of oversight. Give public funds to religious schools. Cut the budgets of the public schools. Hire inexperienced teachers with only five weeks of training. At some point, the public will understand that anyone can teach and that teaching is not a profession. Create national standards that take no account of the diversity of students. Make sure that when they're written, the writing committee has no classroom teachers, no experts on early childhood education, and no one with any knowledge of teaching children with disabilities. If you can convince the wealthiest man in the nation to back these standards, make sure that he gives millions to every national education organization to support the standards to every national civil rights organization, to both major teachers unions, and to almost every think tank inside the Beltway, and some outside the Beltway as well. Make sure there is a well-funded PR campaign to warn parents that if their state doesn't adopt the standards, their child and our nation is doomed. Then once the standards have been adopted, introduce tests matching the standards. Be sure to set a passing mark on the test that is beyond the developmental capacity of most students. Align the passing mark with what is called proficient on the federal test, NAEP, even though NAEP proficient is the equivalent of an A, or at least an A minus. Then when the results come in and most students fail, as they have in every state, blame the teachers. The scores which were designed to fail most students are supposed to set off a clamor for charter schools and vouchers in every city, town, and village. Next, make sure that almost every major philanthropy agrees that we need to turn public education upside down, that we need to get rid of those lousy teachers because they can't raise test scores of the poorest kids, that we need to frighten the American public into believing that we're losing the global economic competition, and that we must have national standards and privatization or we will stagnate. And this, of course, is precisely what has been happening for the past 15 years or more. If you want to be precise, you might say that the current movement to turn public education upside down started in 1983 with a report called A Nation at Risk, which claimed that our public schools were, quote, caught in a rising tide of mediocrity. This was the first major national report sponsored during the Reagan administration that made a connection between the test scores of American students and the economy. The report said that Japan and Germany were taking away our economic predominance because of our lousy public schools. Well, we've been hearing more or less the same charge for 30 years. Uh, just a few years ago in 2012, Joel Klein, who was then the Chancellor of the New York City Public Schools and former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, co-chaired a task force at the Council on Foreign Relations, which issued a report warning that our public schools were so terrible that they endangered national security. What was their evidence? Low test scores. Why, any day, Estonia, Singapore or Finland might invade and take control of our nation because of their higher test scores. <laughs> As their solution to the national security crisis created by the public schools, Klein and Rice said we needed more charters, more vouchers, and the Common Core. What was their evidence for their reforms? Well, there was no evidence. Schools were just beginning to learn, learn what the Common Core standards were. It had never been tried out anywhere, and yet it was described as the salvation for our students and our nation against unnamed international threats. The bottom line consensus, which the media, media dutifully reported, 
was that our public schools were awful and were dragging down our, econ our economy just as they supposedly had been in 1983 when the nation was in recession. Does it help to know that the schools did not drag down our economy in 1983? Does it help to know that national recessions such as the ones we experienced in the early 1980s and in 2008-09 were not caused by the public schools? Does it help to know that the public schools were not endangering our national security in 2012 and that we have the strongest economy and the most powerful military in the world? Does it help to know that corporations outsource jobs not because they can't find skilled workers, but because they want low-wage workers? Why so much venom directed at the public schools? Well, they are an easy scapegoat for our social and economic problems. They cost a lot of money, and they can't fight back. Women comprise about 75% of the education workforce, so they are easily browbeaten by aggressive public figures, and teachers take their lives and their jobs in their hands if they speak up and speak back. You see governors and legislators attacking teachers and teachers unions, but you don't see them criticizing the police for crime rates. You don't see them closing down police stations if there's a crime wave. You don't see them handing out police badges to eager amateurs or threatening to bust the police unions. No, Scott Walker went after the teachers and the social workers and the nurses. He didn't touch the police unions or the fire unions. The current reform movement aims not to improve schools, which implies incremental changes based on evidence, but to privatize them. It is not possible to improve schools by demoralizing the people who work in them. It just doesn't make any sense, and yet that's what's happening. The fundamental strategy of reform today is the use of carrots and sticks. If you or your school produces higher scores, you win a bonus. If you or your school cannot produce higher scores, you will be punished. Teachers will be fired, the principal will be fired, your school will be closed. Understand that the basic psychology of this reform movement is not modern. It's a century old, it's behaviorism. It aligns with the thinking of Frederick Winslow Taylor, the father of social efficiency, who clocked workers' time on task and measured their output with a stopwatch. He advocated that rewards and sanctions would increase efficiency and productivity. Modern cognitive psychology, however, says that professionals are not motivated by rewards and threats. Read Edward Detchy, who wrote Why We Do What We Do. Read Dan Ariely, Predictably Irrational. Read Daniel Pink's book, Drive, which, who writes about the work of Detchy and Ariely. They say that professionals and even non-professionals are motivated by intrinsic rewards, not by extrinsic rewards. The keys to motivation are idealism, mastery, and autonomy. Often people feel that their work is undervalued when they're offered a bonus to do what they want to do. In some of the social experiments performed by social scientists, productivity actually declined when people were offered a, re a reward to do what they love to do. What would we do if we wanted great public schools? First, we would recognize that the purpose of education is not to get higher test scores, but to shape good human beings with good character and to develop their talents and their potential. We would not use test scores as the measure of educational quality. Having spent seven years on the National Testing Board, the Federal Testing Board, I know what flimsy instruments those standardized tests really are. Sometimes the questions are poorly written. Sometimes there are two right answers. Sometimes there are no right answers, and life does not consist of finding the right answer to a question created by some anonymous person. Life does not consist of choosing one of four answers. We must prepare our students to ask questions and to question the right answers. We must prepare them for situations where are there, there are no right answers, only difficult choices. Second, we would make the teaching profession one that deserves and receives respect and acclaim. It should be difficult to enter the teaching profession. It should require years of study, mastering what one will teach, and learning how to teach before becoming fully certified. Teachers should be paid as the professionals they are. Teachers should write their... <laughs> Teachers should write their own test. They know what they taught. Third, states should set broad curriculum standards to make sure that every child has the chance 
to study history, geography, the science, mathematics, literature, foreign languages, and to engage in the arts and physical education. The state should be held accountable to make sure that every school has the staff and the resources it needs to support a full and rich curriculum for every child. Accountability begins at the top, not the bottom. Fourth, states should be accountable for ensuring that all schools are adequately financed so that schools can provide smaller classes, especially for children who are struggling to learn and who need extra attention. Fifth, states should ensure that children in need have access to social workers, psychologists, guidance counselors, and a school nurse. Six, every school should have a library and a qualified librarian. Seventh, school facilities should be not only clean and up-to-date, but beautiful. <laughs> the condition of the school sends a message to children about what we think of them. Eighth, standardized tests should be used sparingly only for auditing and for diagnostic purposes. Standardized tests should never be used to rank, rate, are label children are their teachers. They are a social construct, not a scientific instrument. I'm going to give that's eight. I'm going to give you ten. Ninth, every state and school district should promote racial integration. Racial segregation has been increasing rapidly in the past two decades. This is bad for children, it's bad for our society. I have sometimes dreamed about what would have happened if Arne Duncan had offered that $5 billion to states and district, districts that came up with realistic desegregation plans instead of incentivizing them to fire teachers, close schools, and raise test scores. As I cite in the book Reign of Error, there is now strong evidence that African American children who attended desegregated schools are likelier to graduate high school, likelier to go to college, likelier to graduate college, likelier to have higher lifetime earnings, and to pass on these advantages to their children. Why would we not promote more desegregation? And, and last, we must acknowledge, as social scientists have known for many decades, that poor performance in school is highly correlated with poverty. If we do not reduce poverty, we will continue to scapegoat teachers in schools for conditions over which they have no control. Children in poverty lack medical care, food security, home security, economic security. These things affect their motivation and their health as well as their attendance. Some poor kids will beat the odds, but the odds are stacked against them. The challenge for our society is to change the odds so that all children have equality of educational opportunity. There, there, are, there are three books I would like to recommend to you tonight. As a teacher or, or would-be teacher, I have to give you an assignment. <laughs> One is Bob Herbert's book, Losing Our Way. Bob Herbert was a columnist for many years at the New York Times, and it's a beautifully written book. It's called Losing Our Way. Herbert weaves together different themes, our crumbling national infrastructure, crumbling bridges, crumbling tunnels, crumbling roads, income inequality, wealth inequality, poverty, education, and our readiness to spend trillions on war, but our unwillingness to launch major infrastructure programs that would put our people to work and reduce poverty. The second book is Yang Xiao's Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Dragon? why China has the best and the worst school system in the world. It has the best, he says, because its scores are the highest. It has the worst, he says, because its scores are the highest. <laughs> the pressure to get high test scores, he says, has crushed individuality, risk-taking, creativity, originality, and every other trait that schools should cherish. That is too high a price to pay for test scores. The third book is Pazi Salberg's Finnish Lessons. Salberg shows us a vision of what schooling might be, a school system where children never take a standardized test until the end of high school, where they show off their students' musical talents, 
where students have a recess after every class. It's a nation that treats teachers as accomplished professionals where only 10% of those who want to be teachers are admitted to university programs of education and then spend five years mastering their profession. It's a nation that has national curriculum guidelines but leaves teachers free to decide what and how to teach. It's a nation that conducts a competition for the most beautiful school and then publishes a book to show off its best school architecture. Public education is not a consumer good. We don't go shopping for schools. It's a basic civic responsibility like public safety, public beaches, public parks, public roads. So I am suggesting a paradigm shift. Can we end poverty and racial segregation? Can we raise standards for entry into teaching? Can we give our teachers the respect they deserve? Can we create schools that encourage the love of learning, teach the discipline of craft, and unleash the joy of performance? Can we build schools that recognize children's different needs and different dreams and strive to meet them? That's my dream. Is it an impossible dream? That's for you to decide. That's the work of your generation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer some questions. And I did want to mention that the second annual in lecture in this series, the speaker will be Pazi Salberg from Finland. He was the education minister of Finland. He's a great global authority on uh, schooling and teaching, and he's a fantastic speaker. He also uses ma magnificent multimedia things. I'm, I'm not of that ilk. Uh, <laughs> all I can do is use the computer and the cell phone to blog. But uh, please, if you have any questions, there's a microphone here and a microphone here. I was wondering uh, how a democracy can institute educational change when the policy makers change before the results can be evaluated. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your question. Um, I'm wondering, in a democracy with a change in policymakers that takes place because it's a democracy, how do you evaluate the changes when the policymakers change before the results can be evaluated because education takes such a long period? I think the question is, how do you evaluate the policymakers when it takes such a long time to see educational change? I think that one of the problems we have today is that the idea of accountability has become so distorted. Uh, and I think it began really with No Child Left Behind, this notion that if scores don't go up, then somebody's got to be held accountable. And you start with the teachers, and then you go to the principal, and then uh, you go to the school. Someone has to be named and shamed. Uh, it's a belief in humiliation. And I think that's a misuse of accountability. As I said earlier, accountability begins at the top. It begins with the people who control the money, and who control the policy, and, and that's not teachers. Teachers, of course, should be held accountable and they should be evaluated, but they should be evaluated by human judgment, by the judgments of their peers and also by the people uh, who are their supervisors, uh, not by test scores. That's the worst way to evaluate teachers. How do you change the policymakers? This is a problem that I have wrestled with, and I don't have an easy answer, but I do have a hard answer. Um, and the, the, because we've seen a change in policymakers, we've seen, we thought, many of us thought that when Obama was elected, he would stop No Child Left Behind and bring a more humane approach to education policymaking. And because Linda Darling Hammond, who's a very knowledgeable educator, was his spokesperson during his campaign in 2008, we thought she would be Secretary of Education. So it was a bit of a bait and switch when we ended up with Arne Duncan, who had led the failed Chicago school system, which continues to be in crisis. Um, so we changed policymakers, and there was no change. It just got worse. The emphasis on testing these past seven years have been as bad and worse than they were in the previous eight years. Uh, and this is why I think right now the only tool that I'm aware of that has 
actually gotten the attention of the policymakers is political action, social action, and I'll mention, I could mention a few, but I'll mention two. One is the students of the Newark Student, student Union. Eight of them held a sit-in in the office of the school superintendent who was running their district with a heavy hand with $100 million of Mark Zuckerberg's money and never listening to parents. She wouldn't even come to school board meetings. And eight students held a sit-in in her office, and she's gone. And there's now conversation about maybe control might be returned to Newark after 20 years of state control. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but the students made that conversation possible. They were the voice of the community. That was political action, and it was only eight kids. The other thing that's been very powerful has been the opt-out movement. And in New York State, uh, we saw the opt-outs go from 5% last year to 20% this year. 20% of the test takers in New York State is 220,000 children who were sent to school on testing day and didn't take the test. And they said, I'm opting out. And there were schools where a majority of children didn't take the test. And I'm inclined to think it's going to be even more uh, this next year. That was sent a very powerful message to the governor, to the legislature, and I think if it grows, they can't ignore it. Uh, it has had an impact. Yes. Hello, my name is Laura, I am a senior, and I strongly identify with being Latina, being a person of color in the United States, so this is where my question stems from. What do you think about how well public school systems are, how, are, how well are they attracting and retaining teachers of color? And um, if, it's, if, like, if it's not happening in a good way, how can we change it? How do I think public schools are treating children of color? Is that the question? No, are attracting professionals of color, like for people to become teachers and principals and to join the oh. profession. I think that, uh, People of color, men and women, understand that there is a crisis in the classroom, particularly for children of color. And their path into the education profession is being impaired by the creation of harder and harder, um, I mean, even more ridiculous exams like the EdTPA, uh, which Barbara uh, Mataloni fought against here in Massachusetts. I think that, it should, as I said, it should be hard to become a teacher but I think it shouldn't be so hard that people of color are excluded and that uh, they are not represented in classrooms. I think it's not necessary to have teachers of color for children of color, but there should not be schools where there are no teachers of color. That's ridiculous. And I'd like to see you know, the same integration in teaching staffs that there is uh, in the student population. But I think that uh, first the uh, we must change the climate so that uh, young people who have many, many options before them decide that teaching is their mission and not uh, go into finance or something that might be uh, more lucrative. That might, not might be, will be. <laughs> Hi, Diane. Um, I'm a current, I mean, sorry, I'm a former public uh, school teacher from New York and Arizona. and. A lot of my students, uh, when I was a teacher, um, every year, increasingly, I was seeing more undocumented students in my classroom. Um, and given the current uh, immigration, national immigration debate, and the amount of unaccompanied minors and um, undocumented students um, in public schools as it increasingly grows, what do you see as the implications for this on the future of American public education? Well, I think we need to have uh, a major paradigm shift because we're seeing dramatic demographic changes in our society. I was in Texas last week, and Texas now is majority Latino, uh, something like 51 or 53 percent of the students in, in the public schools in the state are Latino, which means uh, that the legislature, which is not majority Latino, underfunds the, the, the schools, cuts the budget by billions of dollars, and uh, they have a court order now, which I hope will be enforced. Uh, requiring the legislature to adequately fund the schools. But there is this disconnect, as there is in many communities, where there is a predominantly white school board and an all-white school board and black students, where the school board is not representative of and not responsive to the community. And I think in every one of these instances, it behooves people to become 
politically active. I know it's very difficult for undocumented uh, people to do that because they're afraid of being deported, uh, but I th there's a lot of consciousness raising that's needed, uh, and I, I, I see this happening all over the country. In North Carolina, where Reverend Barber has started the Moral Mondays movement, uh, to weave together all of these issues and to get people politically active. That's always the key. I mean, there is not an answer here to all of these questions that I've been discussing that's going to be solved in the classroom. The answer is going to be solved at the ballot box by voting out people who are not willing to pay for the education that children need. Thank you. Yes. And my name is Catherine. Um, I'm also born and raised in Texas, so I understand exactly what you're talking about, uh, especially when you talk about education standards and using standardized tests as uh, an imperative level. So my question to you is, though, I do understand your views on standardized testing. Without some form of standardized testing, how do you how do you intend to hold schools accountable for academic rigor and um, you know some form of academic standard? Well, standardized testing don't, doesn't really hold schools accountable for academic rigor. It usually just uh, holds them accountable for how much time and resources they're willing to devote to prep, test prep. There you go. Um, I w when I was in Texas schools, we actually didn't have standardized testing. Um, and I would amend that s by saying we took standardized personality tests. <laughs> I mean, they were so ridiculous, it, it boggles the mind. Uh, and also aptitude tests that were supposed to tell us what our profession or our, you know, will we be beauticians or auto mechanics or something like that. But they were all silly. The first standardized test I ever saw was the SAT. And at that time, which was 1955, they told us that you couldn't coach for the SAT. Later, they acknowledged that coaching raises scores. And now we have a whole industry that has arisen to uh, coach students so that the more money you have, the more coaching you can afford. And what you have to understand about the standardized test, and I should have mentioned this, is that it's actually a family income predictor. If you look at the SAT, and they publish this every year, they show family income and rank it alongside of test scores. And families with income over $200,000 a year have the highest test scores. Their students have the highest test scores. Family where the income is under $20,000 a year have the lowest test scores. And it's like a stepladder. There's no mix up in the middle. Every additional $20,000 a year of income produces higher scores. So we could actually scrap the whole standardized testing thing and say, what's your family income? And we'll tell you what your test score is going to be. And we'd save so much money, and then we could put it into the arts. I think that what we should be. <laughs> I think what, where we should think of accountability is the accountability of the state and the community to support their schools, to make sure that their schools have adequate resources, to make sure that their schools are giving every, children, every child the opportunity they need, to make sure they have enough teachers and, and they have a fully staffed library. Many, many schools around this country have closed their libraries because, and there are no more librarians in, in cities. Uh, there, there was a school in Philadelphia a couple of years ago where, where a child died of asthma because they had cut the budget so bad, badly in Pennsylvania. Governor Cor Corbett cut a billion dollars out of the budget. And they had no school nurse on that day. Um, she happened to have asthma on the wrong day. Um, but I think the accountability starts with the responsibility. We should think not of accountability, but responsibility. We should expect that our teachers are responsible. Now, when I went to school on the pre-standardized testing days, uh, our teachers were very responsible. They had high standards. Uh, how does the state know they're doing a good job? I think you have an inspection team go out and check the schools that are having problems, do an analysis and say, gosh, uh, you know, they need more, more bilingual educators to help the kids in this school. They need more of this, they need more of that. We need to readjust the formula to make sure that they can educate the children with disabilities that are in this school. So I think the accountability, think of it as the responsibility of the state and the responsibility of people in the school to do what's right for children. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Okay. One, two. Barbara? Okay. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the Teach for America organization and whether it's helping or hurting the current situation. Well, I know uh, a, a number of people who've gone through Teach for America, and what I've discovered is that the people who enter Teach for America are smart, they're idealistic, they want to make a difference, they want to help children, 
And I think the organization is cynical, and it's a business, and it's a major corporation, and they're selling kids as if they were slaves to, to schools. They, TFA has $400 million in the bank, and yet they act as if they're a charity, like the Girl Scouts. And they charge, they charge the districts anywhere from three to $9,000 to get an inexperienced teacher. Uh, I got an email yesterday from a young woman who said that she had joined TFA. Had, uh, after five weeks of training, she had been sent to be a special ed teacher for children with disabilities in the first grade. And she said in her first week, she realized she couldn't do what she was being asked to do. She had no idea how to help these kids. And she felt terrible. She lasted out her two years, but she feels that what she did to those kids was wrong, and what TFA did to her was wrong by sending her in unequipped uh, to help these children. So I think that the idea, the original idea was a great idea, which is to send young people to places where there are spots that need to be filling because there are not enough math teachers, not enough science teachers, but to take away the jobs of experienced teachers to boast that the test scores that we can produce are better than the test scores that experienced teachers can produce, that's, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's bad. It, what Teach for America fundamentally does as a corporation is to deprofessionalize education. It sends the message that anyone can teach, and that's the wrong message. Yes. It's become a popular talking point in Republican debates. Sorry, can, can, you, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Um, that to, you know, to cut the Department of Education, and you know, the talking line is usually something like, you know, the states know better what their, what, that their kids need, like, you know, the federal government is ill-equipped. I'm wondering what your take, your take is on that idea. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing from the left side. Tell me the idea again so I can react to it. Um, the idea that a lot of Republican presidential candidates have that the Department of Education should be, you know, nixed and that it should all just be left to the states. I think there is a federal role and that uh, Secretary Duncan has way overstepped it. Uh, it's very clear that the federal government, its, it's original role it was created as an Office of Education in 1867 for the purpose of uh, gathering the facts and uh, re doing research on the condition of American education and reporting to the American people. That function still exists and it's called the National Center for Education Statistics. That's very important. Federal government also supports education report. Our research, that's very important. The federal government is responsible for enforcing civil rights laws in the schools, that's very important. The federal government is responsible for the protection and funding of special education. Uh, by the way, Congress promised initially with students with disabilities to pay 40% of the cost. They have never paid more than, I think, 12 or 14% of the cost. So every state would have a tremendous budget relief if Congress just followed through on what it promised to do with special education. But the federal government has a special responsibility to help children in, in certain categories, um, and by children with uh, language needs, children with disabilities, uh, and children who are protected classes, especially um, racial and ethnic minorities, and, and gender. So these are all federal responsibilities, and um, I think Title I is also a crucial responsibility, and that's the reason that the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act was passed. It was passed in order to send money to schools based on the number of children who were in poverty. It's been turned into what is now known as No Child Left Behind and become a testing and accountability bill. But it's forgotten that its original mission was to help children in poverty, not to test kids and, and see that they are held to standardized testing. So I think that that is the federal role. Where Duncan has overstepped it was with race to the top and uh, telling uh, people what to teach, how to teach, supporting the common core, doing things like that. These are not federal roles. And that's why in the pending legislation in Congress right now, they, the Senate bill literally strips the, the secretary from having any power to interfere with state decisions about curriculum instruction and assessment. Actually, those were already in law, but he ignores it anyway. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, hi, I'm Maggie, and I grew up in Atlanta Public Schools during the standardized testing cheating scandal. Um, and I was wondering, who do you believe should be held accountable, and how should they be held accountable for uh, cheating scandals? 
Are you speaking of Atlanta? Yes. Yeah. I think that the, um, what's interesting about Atlanta was that a number of educators were sentenced to jail. Some of their sentences were commuted. All of them lost their jobs. All of them lost their pensions. All of them were totally disgraced. And so far as I know, nobody who crashed the American economy in 2008 was held accountable <laughs> for anything. Now, understand, I'm a, I don't approve of cheating, and I think that when people cheat, they should lose their job. I don't think they should go to jail, because uh, until we start sending a corrupt uh, people in the economy to jail, we shouldn't be sending teachers to jail. They're not, they, they didn't even make any money from cheating, <laughs> whereas a lot of the bankers made millions of dollars and were never held accountable. So I think that lo losing their job is the appropriate punishment for cheating. Thank you. Barbara, any more questions? I'll take two more. Okay. Yes, over here. Hi, my name's Megan. I'm a National Board Certified Teacher, and I'm directing a teacher leadership program right now at Mount Holyoke College, of which we have some of our students here. Um, and I'm also right now uh, co-hosting a Twitter chat, and the question on the Twitter chat has to do with the change in Secretary of Education. And the question is, what are your hopes with the new secretary, with John King, Jr.? I have no hopes at all. <laughs> Unfortunately, in New York State, John King was a uh, first out of the gate to uh, push the Common Core before any teachers were prepared for it. He was first out of the gate to test the Common Core. He said in advance that 70% of the kids would fail, and he was right on. He predicted it to the, to the exact number because he helped to set the cut score. 70% failed. Uh, he's a great believer in high-stakes testing, and. Um, he comes out of the Uncommon Schools Charter, Charter Network, which is one of the no, no excuses schools. And his own school in Massachusetts had, I think, the highest suspension rate in the state, whereas the US Department of Education says that suspension's a bad disciplinary tool. So I think it'll be very interesting to see uh, whether he changes at all in this next year. But I, I really have very little expectation that he or anyone at the Department of Education will change the direction because it is so set on following through with the initiatives that have been put in place and calling them a success, even when uh, the polls show that parents and teachers are increasingly upset with what's happening in their schools and to their children. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you very much for coming. I really admire all the work that you do in, the, in your writing. Um, I'm a fourth grade teacher and um, I, I'm wondering what you would, what advice you would give of how to work towards the 10 objectives that you outlined at the end of your speech um, from a teacher's perspective and how we can work towards those, those goals. I, there are two things I would recommend. First is you can't do it alone. You must join with others. And so if you're a teacher, uh, get active in your teacher association and join with others who uh, want to change things. Um, and I'm going to give you three things. The second, second thing is you must become politically active because it's the people in the legislature who are making decisions over which teachers have little or no control. And in state after state, the only answer is to throw the rascals out. Um, the third thing, and it's really important, is to keep within yourself the vision of what is right and what is ethical so that no matter what they tell you to do, even if you're forced to do it, know that it's wrong and don't ever forget what's right. Thank you.